My name's John Mazzori. I'm a music journalist specializing in reggae music. I started in 1988 uh, with Black Echoes, which soon afterwards became Echoes. And uh, I'm still writing for them today, as well as quite a few other places. And um, my love for reggae music is undimmed, I have to say. <laughs> I'm so pleased it's still around. I'm so happy we're not rock and roll fans or, or, or any other fans of any other genre, which has pretty much disappeared. Uh, reggae is very much alive. I'd like to start from your beginnings. I remember when we first spoke, you talked about um, how you have a gypsy background. It was curious because my grandfather was gypsy and um, which made me a uh, quarter gypsy. But uh, it was a very taboo subject when I was growing up. It was almost like a stain on the family. And um, in those days, um, if a, a, a Romani person married outside of the family, they had to give up uh, not only all their links to the culture but uh, uh, and their relatives, but also their name. So he took on my grandmother's name and um, and there it was. And so I actually didn't grow up with any knowledge of, of the gypsy lifestyle, um, but I certainly received stick for it. Um, you know, from people in the community and so on. And it was a weird feeling because, you know, you're kind of insulted or put down for something that you, you have no connection with. That was very strange. And um, the people who were just not at all judgmental about that um, were the Caribbean people, um, you know, I met in Nottingham, and um, these were members of the, what they call the Windrush generation. And um, those people were actually more welcoming uh, quite often towards me than uh, people of my own so-called tribe. And my affiliation with Jamaican culture and Jamaican music really started from there. Um, uh, I had... It, it, identity issues, just like just like um, some of the people at school who who were born into Caribbean families had, uh, they didn't feel part of something either. So um, there was a little something there that we had in common, apart from football, girls, and all the other things you know that young people are into. You know, so for you. Jamaican mm. music, there wasn't really a introduction to it. It was just always around. Yes, it was, because um, at that time, um, when I was at school, I, I was 11 when Millie had uh, that hit, My Boy Lollipop, and she was on television and on the radio and so on. And that opened the floodgates uh, here in the UK, um, we had a whole string of, of reggae artists on the chart shows, on television, on the radio. Um, it was an underground. It was Desmond Decker. It, it was Prince Buster. It was um, the Ethiopians. It was the Pioneers. I mean, Bob and Marcia, you know. Um, it, it was pop music, just like... In fact, I have to be honest that... Um, the more esoteric uh, music that we were listening to was the American R&B um, and blues music, which, um, you know, no no one I knew had ever been to Chicago or, or Detroit, or, but plenty of people I knew had been to Jamaica or was very, even from there. So um, Jamaican music was um, uh, part of the British popular culture at that point. It didn't stay like that, but in my formative years as a teenager, it, it was very commercial and overground and and um, available. Down the road, you became involved in sound system, right? Well, 
Uh, I was 15 when, when I went to my first blues party, as we called them, Shibis. <laughs> that was a that was a life changing experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, they were no they were nowhere near as powerful as they became later on, but the uh. walls did shake. <laughs> 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 and um, oh, fabulous! I mean, what can I say? You know, I had no idea what I was listening to because no one ever said what anything was called. Um, <clears throat> but I loved it. I, I loved the whole experience of it. And um, it was, there were other young people there. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't like you had to pretend to be an adult uh, as you did to get into clubs. Um, and when I finally got to Jamaica, that was the same thing that you go to dancers and the children there are grandparents the, the, you know the whole world is there the whole community is there and those blue blues parties were like that so i was very lucky to be growing up in that era you know and you oh, see nottingham was a place it, it didn't have heavy industry it had light industry like um cigarettes electronics bicycles you know and um what that meant was that women could do that work and so a lot of um uh, a lot of uh, women came from the caribbean to places like nottingham worked in these factories and then sent for their children and so on and so um i think nottingham was popular with members of the windrush generation for that um that's how that kind of came about. It was the light industry. It was opportunities for work, you know. I left though when I was 19 and then I went to London. So uh, London in the very early 70s, uh, that was a whole different thing because people were less welcoming, more race conscious in those days. And uh, you gotta be cool, you know, uh, which I, I very rarely managed to be cool in, in those days. <laughs> Do you know what I wanted to be at that time was a, a, an artist. Uh, that was my whole thing. I, I really wanted to be an artist. Um, I worked at the Tate Gallery as a, a gopher. You know, I just used to run errands. and uh, But I was seeing all these great paintings every day. And... Um, it's, um, yeah, trying to make headway with that, practicing painting and so on, and going to lots of gigs, uh, buying lots of music, and um, uh, and the music started changing then. Um, before I left Nottingham, the skinheads emerged, and um, I've heard all kinds of stories that the London skinhead started with mods, and they were really into black culture and so on, and very respectful of it. Uh, the skinheads we had in Nottingham, those messages did not travel up the M1. <laughs> they were racist thugs, full stop. You know, um, I had some frightening experiences before I left of being in blues parties, chanting mobs outside, uh, of being in clubs where Jamaican music was played, and then, you know, at the door and causing all this trouble and making threats and so on. And uh, it was very heavy. And um, uh, Jamaican music disappeared very quickly from the charts, from um, the mainstream, from the BBC as a result, because where the skinheads went, they caused damage, they, they caused trouble at venues, they, they were aggressive and, and so on. And, um, and that kind of mainstream society shut the door on and reggae music. And, um, and then this miracle happened, reggae changed, there was this more conscious element came in and the whalers, came on BBC singing Concrete Jungle and the turning point came and fantastic, the skinheads didn't like it. Uh, they didn't want to go back to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was great. That was, that was a whole new era began there 
and um, <clears throat> and London, um, so many young people from Caribbean families started playing the music and putting their own spin on it at that time. So many sound systems came. And um, so again, it was being in the right place at the right time, really. Um, there was so much talent came out of that period, um, you know, from the mid seventies onwards. Now you mentioned being an artist. Was that something that you you've always known how to do or? Yeah, um, my earliest memories were wanting to be an artist. And uh, I used to draw constantly. And um, when I was 16, I, I um, was recommended for a scholarship to art school and was accepted. But my, my parents, like many other parents, um, decided that no one made their living through art. And so um, they refused to sign for me. I needed their permission. And that was heartbreaking, actually. And that was behind me leaving Nottingham, I guess, to to prove them wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, it became a mission, you know. Um, I was determined to prove them wrong. And um, when I got to Brighton, I moved to Brighton in 1976 and um, did a lot of painting, had exhibitions and so on. Um, my... Um, <laughs> my my uh, chief patron at that time was the uh, an archbishop <laughs> actually <laughs> um <clears throat> he liked large scale nudes you know i remember mm -hmm. uh, but um <clears throat> when i did uh, artwork for um album covers and and things like that um but i also started djing and um because um the music was still underground at that time. In Brighton, um, there was very little reggae scene. And uh, there was just this outpouring of wonderful music. Um, Bonnie Lee and Lee Perry and all of this stuff that how could you resist, really? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I met some people and we started a sound system and, you know, commissioning a preamp from Jatabi and things like that. You know, it was um, it, it was just that great time when uh, people really want, uh, so many young people wanted to be a part of a sound system. And um, it was a magical time. And, um, and we played lots of house parties and, um, and people would come down from London and, uh, you know, for um, for me in, in Brighton, playing in these places, and you know, some nights I remember just ended uh, coming down, and uh, you know, people like uh, DJs from London would come down because they love coming to Brighton at the weekend, and um, very exciting time, and that in turn led to radio, um, because I kind of got fed up of people asking for Bob Marley and UB40 every night, you know, so, <laughs> so, and playing on the radio, you know, you're just there, contained, so yep. it was a better option. <laughs> and the writing came out of that as well, because I was playing all the songs, and um, Mikey Dredd, a friend of, of mine, was actually Mikey Dredd's girlfriend, and... Um, uh, before that, she was Barrington Levy's girlfriend. But um, Mikey, Mikey said, um, "Oh, I, I've I've had a." He wanted to. Uh, that's right. He wanted to uh, do a, a a documentary on Studio One, and he asked me if I'd help him with the writing side of things. He was going to narrate it, so I did some writing with him, and he said. Um, oh, you should review, you know, some music for, for Black Echoes. I'm going to have a word for you. <laughs> Great, you know, I wasn't expecting anything. And then uh, he came back to me and said, um, yeah, it's all set up. You know, I, I've spoken to them. It's all set up. Uh, the editor's name is Debbie Kirby. Give her a ring. Tell her, you know, 
I recommended you. So <clears throat> I was a bit nervous. I phoned her and she'd never heard of me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he hadn't said a word to her, you know. Uh, but she said to send her some stuff anyway. And that's how it started. That was 1988, you know. So it was pure accident. Mm -hmm. That's a very Jamaican thing. <laughs> so I discovered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it worked, you know. And you still write from today. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah. And I, it's funny because I started uh, reviewing um, the, the latest dancehall tunes that the other writers there didn't want to do. And it was people like Tiger and Shabaranks and Super Cat. And these were all young guys at the time. And um, I thought that period was so exciting. Um, those guys were larger than life. Um, the lyrics could make you laugh. Um, and even when they did gun lyrics and they acted like a bad man, you know, there was it was theatrical. It was, um, it's like they were adopting these characters. And um, when I started interviewing them, um, it was, um, and, and, and especially where they were coming from. I, I just thought it was amazing that people born with nothing and with so few opportunities could create a character and create a music that could take them around the world, you know, and, and bring them all of this um, recognition and they created it all themselves out of nothing. I still find that miraculous to this day. I think it's the single most important thing that keeps me with this music um, is reggae music's ability to transform people's lives. You did join a pirate radio, right? Oh, yeah, that was late 80s. That was... Um, yeah. That was, yeah, student radio, um, University of Sussex, and also um, pirate radio was, um, and that was in the era when um, you always had to make sure that there was a window and a drain pipe. So, you know, <laughs> if anything happened at the front door, you could um, you could shin out the, the back, you know. And uh, <clears throat> that was called Phase FM. And the guy who ran that radio station, Daniel Nathan, today owns the um, the big commercial station in in Brighton. So he he went legit, and uh, he really did well for himself in that world. But um, then uh, the government brought into the, this ruling that um, whoever was caught. Uh, um, you know, playing records on a, on a pirate station would not only lose whatever you had with you um, at the, the the venue, but they could also come to your house and take away all of your records, all of your music equipment, um, anything to do with music they could take. And so um, a fat boy Slim, who, who was Norman Cook at that time and Carl Cox who was around and and uh, uh, Russ Dubry and, and a few of us doing this pirate station all decided that we couldn't be doing it anymore because we had lots of records and and we had a lot to lose and we weren't getting paid or anything we were just doing it because we loved the music you know so that changed everything and <clears throat> and then um there were these things called restricted service licenses, which meant that you could run a radio station for like a month um, legitimately. And in Brighton, there was a festival every year, there still is, called Brighton Festival, uh, in the whole of the month of May. So we had this um, we had this temporary license, and every May we'd have these this radio station 24 seven. And um, um, I was able to introduce lots of new reggae music to that station, which was great. Um, everything was less than three months old um, that we played. Um, 
because um, uh, there was none of that, you know, available. Um, and um, so that was great fun. We did that for years. And um, uh, and I still do occasional ra radio now, you know, um, sometimes with my son, who's a selector and a promoter. And uh, <laughs> so it's become a family business, you know. <laughs> 